Hello everyone. Um, it is August 3rd, 1.58 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I just wanted to do a kind of a follow-up video to my video of yesterday, which was kind of just general and brief about current situations in the world that we're currently facing. And I wanted to elaborate a little bit on apostasy. Um, so I think when we when we think of the apostasy of our generation that we're currently living in, we need to ask ourselves, are we living in the end times apostasy or are we living in a great apostasy that may not necessarily be the end times apostasy? And I think the answer is we don't know. That's the answer. We really don't know. Only God knows the end, so to speak. Um, but I do want to say I don't think in the history of the world there has ever been such an apostasy on a global orchestrated level. And that to me is the concerning part. So what I want to do um, is just shed some light on the church teachings on the end times from the catechism and then compare it to some private revelation and maybe just have a conversation about obviously this is an apostasy and we need to obviously define that and I, I'm going to try to do that the best as I can um, through the course of this video but is it the end times apostasy is it the great apostasy preceding the great tribulation of the end times directly before the coming of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Interesting times that we are living in for sure. And my comments yesterday, if you didn't watch that video, you can go back and watch it. Um, we're mostly in relation to the medical tyranny that has seemingly taken over and really is being um, promoted from the church hierarchy as far as the moral thing to do would be to take the experimental jab, if you will. Now, anyway, um, I want to read from two catechisms. The first I want to read from is this old one. This is from the 1800s, 1862. The catechism explained an exhaustive exposition of the Christian religion with special reference to the present state of society in the spirit of the age, a practical manual. And this is the Sparago and Clark one that was written by them. Um, but it's not, it's very general. It sticks very closely to scripture without any real interpretation from the church. Um, and the newer catechism actually really defines a lot that the older ones do not. And I think it's just we're better able to define define the end times as we approach the end times. Um, things become more clear. So I'm going to first read, like I said, this one sticks very closely to scripture. And it um, starts, the heading is, The day of judgment is unknown to us, though certain signs have been revealed which are to herald its approach. Christ said, Of that day and hour no one knoweth, no, not the angels of heaven, but the Father alone. The knowledge of it would be as little use as the knowledge of the hour of our death. St. Augustine recommends us to do now as we should do if tomorrow were to be the last day. Then we shall have no occasion to dredge the coming of the judge. Christ gave some signs of the approach of the last day, so that Christians might remain steadfast and, and courageous. The signs are, 1. The gospel shall be preached to the whole world. And they add in here, um, some two-thirds of the world are still pagans. Now, obviously, this was in the 1800s. And I don't know that I necessarily agree with that assessment. Um, it just says, in Scripture, the gospel will be preached to the whole world, not necessarily that people will be converted. And I think we can argue with the use of the Internet and technology now, that if the gospel hasn't been preached to the whole world, um, it's fast approaching that, right? Two, the greater part of mankind will be without faith. And that's from Luke and Thessalonians. And immersed in things of earth. Again, um, from Luke. And mankind will be much as they were in the days of Noah. And that was in Matthew. So let me just read that all together. The greater part of mankind will be without faith and immersed in things of earth. Mankind will be much as they were in the days of Noah. 
Wow. Um, I don't think there's any arguing that. The greater part of mankind's is without faith. And I think we fool ourselves with this one by calling nations Christian nations and this, that, and the other thing. But the truth of the matter is this. Just because you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God does not mean you have faith. Even Satan believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. To have faith, to possess faith, to be with faith, is not only believing that Jesus is God, but it's also believing that if you act out and follow Jesus, if you follow the path that he has pointed out to you, that you will obtain heaven through the remission of sins and his mercy and his sacrifice. To have faith is to believe that Jesus Christ died so that heaven could be open to us, but to, but we have still have to do our part to walk in faith. So I, I would argue that even amongst the people who believe that Jesus is God and who could even attend church, most, I would say a majority, the greater part of so-called Christians and especially of mankind don't necessarily follow the precepts of the faith, especially in areas such as um, artificial contraception, birth control, especially in areas of homosexuality, mostly the sexual sins, fornication, living in a, you know in relationships that are not marriage. Um, so I would argue that the greater part of mankind is without faith. They don't necessarily believe that if they this is you know the path to get to heaven. This is this is the path to follow to follow Jesus. So the Antichrist will appear. Number three, Antichrist is a man who will give himself out to be Christ, and by the help of the devil will perform many wonders. He will be a terror by the persecution which he will raise. It is probable that he will choose for his kingdom Jerusalem and those places where Christ lived. Our Lord will kill him on the last day. Types and forerunners of Antichrist have existed from time to time, for the mystery of iniquity already worketh. Obviously, that has not happened yet. Four, Enoch and Elias, uh, or they call Henoch and Elias, Enoch and Elijah is how we know them, will return and preach penance. Behold, I will send you Elias the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. He will bring, i.e., he will bring round the Jews to the sentiments of their forefathers, the patriarchs. Christ also foretold that Elias should come and restore all things. Of Enoch, we know that Enoch pleased God and was translated into paradise that he may give repentance to the nations. Enoch and Elias will preach for three years and a half and recover many souls from the Antichrist who in the end will kill them and their bodies will be left unburied. After three days and a half, God will raise them to life again. Now, this catechism in, is interpreting Enoch in Elijah's coming physically. Um, a lot of theologians don't really, they believe it's more symbolic. I don't know, but I will say this about Elijah. If you go back and read Sorry, if you go back and watch my video on the scapular, um, a commenter, I forget who it was, but thank you, commented down below about the scapular being an extension of the cloak or the garments of Elijah, Elias. And why is this important? Because this was the whole scene, Elijah the prophet, his, his claim to fame, at least as far as I'm concerned, is that he goes up to the mountain, the same mountain that Our Lady of Mount Carmel appeared on. Um, he goes up there. So Elijah is really considered the founder of the Carmelites from the Old Testament, you can see. So she, anyway, um, Elijah goes up there and confronts Baal. There's Baal worship going on, B-A-A-L. And he confronts the priests of Baal and there's this whole thing where he kind of taunts him and says, oh, he must be sleeping. That's why he's not helping you. And obviously, um, the, the one true God that Elijah worships, our God, God the Father, sends down fire in the, in the whole dramatic scene. But there's also something that happens, I think, is directly before, or maybe not directly, it's either before or after that um, with his cloak. And this cloak is 
kind of like a sacramental, I guess you can say, an early sacramental because it has holy properties. It enables him to cross the river, uh, to dry up a certain part of the river so that he can then cross it and do God's work. So the scapular that the Blessed Virgin gave um, to the Carmelites is an extension of that, of the garments of Elijah. Where was I going with that? Oh, um, so it's a powerful in, first of all, Baal, as we know from Exorcist, is the demon of impurity. He's responsible for impurity in society on a great level, such as fornication, right? So against impurity, the scapular is powerful, a, a powerful conductor of grace against impurity, but also not just physical, sexual impurity, but also spiritual impurity, fornicating with other gods, fornicating with false doctrines. And I think it's very important that in Fatima, the scapular was seen by Sister Lucia. And in, in Fatima, the third secret begins with, the contested third secret begins with, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will be preserved. Meaning that other places, the dogma of the faith will not be preserved. So that's pretty terrifying. So I think those who put the scapular on will receive special graces to be preserved in purities. You know, not only physical physical purity, but spiritual purity. To hold true to the true doctrines of the church. I just went off on a whole thing. Five, the Jews will be converted. The conversion of the Jews was foretold by O.C., which I think we say Hosea. The children of Israel shall sit many days without king and without prince and without sacrifice and without altar and without ephod and without theraphim. And after this, the children of Israel shall return and shall seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall fear the Lord in his goodness in the last days. Blindness was to be the law of Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles should come in. Elias is to restore the tribes, uh, or Elijah, of Jacob. Six, dreadful signs will appear in the heavens and great tribulations will come upon mankind. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be moved. And again, I think there's a very spiritual meaning to that as well. Um, but I'm not going to get into all that. And then the physical meaning, that could have a physical meaning, but it's, a, it's definitely spiritual as well. War, pestilence, and famine shall come as at the time of the siege of Jerusalem. And there is just no denying that that is upon us right now. Um, and it will just continually get worse. Men shall wither with fear from expectation of the things that will come upon the earth. And I always took this also spiritually, especially the pestilence. Um demons being unleashed from hell, the veil being thinned, the demonic being able to be felt more and seen more and have more influence upon the people of the earth and even the elements of the earth in the last days. And I don't think anybody can argue that that appears to be happening right now. So then we move to this catechism, the new, I guess some people call it St. John Paul II catechism. And again, I like to refer to an older one and a newer one, so I like to get the complete picture. Um, and I think if you're one of those people that just refuses, outright refuses the new catechism, you're missing out because there are some extraordinary insights that the older ones don't have, especially right here. So starting at paragraph 674, the church's ultimate trial. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo uh, messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Wow, let's unpack that before we move on. 
The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. Now, if that does not sound like what we are currently dealing with, I don't know how much more on target that we could get here in this catechism. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Now, that's extraordinarily important, which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. And the, the, there will be a physical person of the Antichrist, but understand that is, that physical person is a reflection and a culmination and is let into the world because of this, because the people of God have accepted a religious deception in which man glorifies himself in place of God. Now, if we go to the Apocalypse, the book of the Apocalypse, or the book of Revelations, we have the mark of the beast, right? And what is the mark of the beast, number 666? And what is what does the number 6 signify? It's the number of mankind, it's, it's also the number of extreme imperfection because six is not quite seven, which is thought to be the number of perfection in, in the Bible. So therefore, one could argue that the mark of the beast is the mark of mankind. It's this culmination, this manifestation of man glorifying himself over God. Now, let's put this in perspective to what we're dealing with right now without getting this video taken down. We have a largely, from what it seems, uh, all right, we have a, we have a problem. The problem is that there was evidently a virus that was killing all kinds of people and causing businesses to, to go out of business and shut down and wreaking havoc on the economy and people's health, and people lost the ability to attend mass, people lost the ability to, you know, leave their house, things like that. So that was the problem. The solution that we're being told is to get an experimental gene therapy jab. It's not approved. It's authorized for use, emergency use, but is not approved by the proper channels. Let's not make any mistake here about that. That's the truth. And how it's being portrayed not only by the world, and this is this is the scary part. This is what points us back to, to what it says here in the catechism, this religious deception. Not only is this, oh, let's not forget the most important part, the moral part of it. Not only is it immoral to experiment on humans, okay? Because that's what's happening. Make no mistake about it. And start tampering with DNA. Start tampering with genetic codes put into place by the creator himself. But all of this was brought into fruition through stem cell research in, in which these particular companies in this particular in, in industry purchased dead aborted babies in order to conduct their research. There's a whole industry in which dead sacrificed babies are used to for med in the name of, of medical research. If that is not glorifying man above God, I'm not sure what is. So now we're being told that the answer is to close the churches down. The answer isn't necessarily to even go to the sacrifice of the mass and receive the Eucharist in this particular scenario. No, the, the universal answer, the universal answer in the Roman Catholic Church, the true church started by Jesus Christ himself was to, sorry, so the universal response to this alleged problem was it was not to have processions through the streets although I think that took place in some isolated areas but the overall response was to shut down the holy sacrifice of the mass keep people from the sacraments 
and then start demanding and promoting illicit um, medical experimentation by all of the church hierarchy, not all of them, but all the ones that matter, all the very public ones, everyone who has a say in the church has come out and promoted this apparent solution to our problems at the price, at the price of apostasy from the truth. And what is the truth? Thou shall not kill. That's the truth. That's a commandment. All right. The anti paragraph 676. The Antichrist deception already begins to take shape in the world every time. And I'm sorry, just going back, I really want to. Em- I'm sorry. I just really want to emphasize the fact that instead of the the shepherds and the hierarchy promoting going to the mass in offering up more sacrifices and more penance to get rid of this alleged problem, they took the man-made solution. They took their own solutions. They took the solutions of man over the solutions of God. The eve On the eve before this, this pandemic became well-known or whatever, um, Our Lady of Akita, the seer from Our Lady of Akita, had a visit from an angel who... In, in no uncertain terms, told her pe- sackcloth and ashes to put on sat that humanity needs to put on sackcloth and ashes. I'm paraphrasing, but that was the premise of the message. Why? Because that's the route our, our leaders needed to take us. They needed to take us the route of sackcloth and as- ashes, which is penance, that we had to humble ourselves before the Lord and ask him to make this problem go away. The answer was not to make the problem go away by taking uh, an experimental medical intervention derived from human sacrifice. That wasn't the answer, but that's what we did. So if that's not an apostasy, uh, a solution to our problems at the price of apostasy from the truth, then I'm not really sure what is. Now, again, there could be an end times event, an end times apostasy, and this may not be it, but this in any event is a giant apostasy from the truth. Giant. Giant. Two, why? As an apparent solution to our problems. I mean, this is concerning that I have to sit in mass and listen to the announcements before mass, and they're talking about free free clinics on the church premises. Like, I, I don't know... How, and I look around and no one bats an eyelash. I, I don't, I'm like, really? I, I, nobody gets it. Like, it's like they're in a satanic trance. And it's insane to me that somebody that attends mass every Sunday can be in such a satanic trance. I don't know how that happens. Paragraph 676. The Antichrist deception already begins to take shape in the world every time the claim is made to realize within history that messianic hope which can only be realized beyond history through the es- eschatological, es- I can never say this word, es- eschatological <laughs> judgment. The church has rejected even modified forms of this falsification of the kingdom to come under the name of men. Mal- mal- uh millennialism, especially the intrinsically perverse political form of secular messianism. So what it's that saying is setting up paradise on earth through politics, basically, is condemned by the church. The church will enter the glory of the kingdom only through this final Passover, when she will follow her Lord in his death and resurrection. The kingdom will be fulfilled then not by a historic triumph of the church through a progressive ascendancy, but only by God's victory over the final unleashing of evil. And so that's the question we are faced with. Are we in the final unleashing of evil? That remains to be seen, because if we are, the catechism is very clear in telling us that only through God's intervention and his triumph will this go away, will anything be restored 
Um, if we are not, then we are going through maybe a minor chastisement and we are going through a purification period in which the church will then be reborn. And the end is still yet to come. And this is just a unleashing of evil, not the final unleashing of evil. Okay. So, but only by God's victory over the final unleashing of evil, which will cause his bride to come down from heaven. God's triumph over the revolt of evil will take the form of the last judgment after the final cosmic upheaval of this passing world. So I think these are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Um, And obviously, we're not going to know until time goes on and time plays out. If we are, in fact, in the end times apostasy, where we can expect the the coming of the return of our Lord, or if we are in a purification period. To me, the two don't seem to to go hand in hand. We are either in a purification period or we are in the end of days. You know, the last, the very last days. We're always in the end of days ever since Christ died on the cross. And I think we need to um, pray about it and ask ask ourselves exactly where we're at. Now, to me, I, I don't, you know, I always say I don't know how much more global it can get. Like the fact, that's what does it for me. Not that, you know, Christians have been persecuted worse in the past and everything else like that, but it's never been simultaneously on a global level where there is no refuge, where there's nowhere to hide. And that's what we're up against right now. There's nowhere to go to and seek asylum. And we're just going to have to keep watching, um, watching the signs of the times, watching and praying. And now with that being said, I do want to shift gears here and bring in some private revelation that I just want to bring in some private revelation that comment on comments on the great apostasy or the apostasy of the end days or maybe not the end days. That's what we need to figure out. Now, the first one I want to read is um, Our Lady of Bueno Suceso. Most people know it as Our Lady of Good Success um, in Quito, Ecuador. And I want to start with this one because this leaves much up to debate. In fact, it almost seems to lean towards the fact that we are now living in a time which is bad, but there will be some sort of restoration. So that would point more towards the argument that we are going through an apostasy in that it's in a, there will be a purification that comes out of it and there will be um, some sort of restoration of Catholicism, true Catholicism, in that we are not in fact living in the end times when Jesus himself has to come and get rid of the Antichrist, which means the Antichrist would still be far off if we are taking that view. So, and this also, um, people say, goes hand in hand with Fatima, where, she, you know, uh, the Blessed Virgin set promises an era of peace. Now, many argue that we haven't seen an era of peace. Some argue that we have seen an era of peace. But you could kind of fit the puzzle pieces together of, this purification of this purification needing to happen, you know, because of an apostasy that may not necessarily be the end of days apostasy. So here we are, February 2nd, he, there's four messages and they're pretty quick. So I'll just read all of them. February 2nd, 1594. I am Mary of good success, whom you have invoked with such tender affection. And just note, February 2nd is the feast of the purification. It's the the presentation in the temple. But the presentation in the temple was also a purification where after a certain number of days, the Jewish women would offer sacrifices in the temple to purify themselves after childbirth. So I am Mary of good success, whom you have invoked with such tender affection. Your prayer has pleased me very much. Your faith has brought me here. Your love has invited me to visit you. And this was obviously given to Mother Mariana of Jesus Torres, um, in researcher. She's awesome. I did a video on Our Lady of Good Success, so you can go back and watch it, or Our Lady of Buenos Successo. 
January 16th, 1599. Now I ask and command you to have a statue made for me, made for the consolation and preservation of my co convent and for those faithful souls of that epoch during which there will be a great devotion to me. For I am the queen of heaven under many invocations. With the making of the statue, I will favor not only my convent, but also the people of Quito and the people throughout the centuries. First, so that men in the future might realize how powerful I am in placing, placating divine justice and obtaining mercy and pardon for every sinner who comes to me with a contrite heart. For I am the mother of mercy, and in me there is only goodness and love. And second, when tribulations of spirit and sufferings of the body oppress them and they seem to be drowning in this bottomless sea let them gaze at my holy image and i will always be there ready to listen to their cries and soothe their pain tell them that they should always run to their mother with confidence and love january 16th 1611 our lady against them the impious will rage a cruel war overwhelming them with vituperations calumnies and vexations in order to stop them from fulfilling their ministry but they like firm columns will remain unswerving and will confront everything with a spirit of humility and sacrifice with which they they will be vested by virtue of the infinite merits of my most holy son who will love them in the innermost fibers of his most holy and tender heart the small number of souls who hidden will preserve the treasures of the faith and practice virtue will, will suffer a cruel, unspeakable, and prolonged martyrdom. Many will succumb to death from the violence of their sufferings, and those who sacrifice themselves for the church and their country will be counted as martyrs. In order to free men from the bondage to these heresies, those whom the merciful love of my most holy son has designated to effect the, res the restoration will need great strength of will constancy valor and confidence of the just there will be occasions when all will seem lost and paralyzed this then will be the happy beginning of the complete restoration so let's pause there for a second um now could this be referring to the final restoration of the new jerusalem or is it just referring to a restoration after a certain period of nastiness? Under the appearance of virtue and bad spirited zeal would turn upon religion who nourished them at her breast. During this time, insomuch as this poor country will lack the Christian spirit, the sacrament of extreme unction will be little esteemed. Many people will die without receiving it, either because of the negligence or their families or their false sentimentality that tries to protect the sick from seeing the gravity of their situations or because they will rebel against the spirit of the Catholic Church impelled by the malice of the devil. Now, if that doesn't describe right now. Thus, many souls will be deprived of innumerable graces, consolations, and the strengths they need to make that great leap from time to eternity. As for the sacrament of matrimony, sacrament of matrimony, which symbolizes the union of Christ with his church, it will be attacked and profaned in the fullest sense of the world world. Definitely going fullest sense of the word going on now in the world. Masonry, which will then be in power, it is, will en enact iniquitous laws with the objective of doing away with this sacrament, making it easy for everyone to live in sin encouraging the procreation of illegitimate children born without the blessing of the church. And that is obviously, I mean, just look at Hollywood. Everything is about sex and not necessarily within marriage. The Christian spirit will rapidly decay. Here we are extinguishing the precious light of faith until it reaches the point that there will be an almost total and general corruption of customs. The effects of secular education will increase, which will be one reason for the lack of priestly and religious vocations. The sacred sacrament of holy orders will be ridiculed, oppressed, and despised. The demon will try to persecute the ministers of the Lord in every possible way, and he will labor, labor with cruel and subtle astuteness to deviate them from the spirit of their vocation, corrupting many of them. These corrupted priests who will scandalize the Christian people... Hmm, will incite the hatred of the bad Christians and the enemies of the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church to fall upon all priests. 
This apparent triumph of Satan will bring enormous sufferings to the good pastors of the church. Moreover, in these unhappy times, there will be unbridled luxury, which acting thus to snare the rest into sin will conquer innumerable frivolous souls who will be lost. <coughs> Innocence will almost no longer be found in children, nor modesty in women, and in this supreme moment of need, the church, in need of the church, those who should speak will fall silent. But know, beloved daughter, that when your name is made known in the t 20th century, there will be many who will not believe, claiming that this devotion is not pleasing to God, a simple humble faith in the truth of my apparitions to you, my child, will be reserved for humble and fervent souls, docile to the inspirations of grace, for our Heavenly Father communicates his secrets to the simple of heart, and not to those whose hearts are inflated with pride, pretending to know what they do not or self-satisfied with empty knowledge. Hmm. The secular clergy, it just reminds me of what terminology do they use? Remote, removed, remote, evil for the abortion-tainted medical experimentation. Yeah. The secular clergy will leave much to be desired because priests will become careless in their sacred duties, lacking the divine compass. They will stray from the road traced by God for the priestly ministry, and they will become attached to wealth and riches. PPP program, anyone? PPP money? Which they will unduly strive to obtain. How the church will suffer during this dark night, lacking a prelate and father to guide them with paternal love, gentleness, strength, wisdom, and prudence. Many priests will lose their spirit, placing their souls in great danger. This will mark the arrival of my hour. Therefore, clamor insist insistently, without tiring, and weep with bitter tears in the privacy of your heart, imploring our celestial Father that for love of the Eucharistic heart of my most holy son in his precious blood shed with such generosity in the profound bitterness and sufferings of his cruel passion and death he might take pity on his ministers and bring to an end these ominous times sending to his church the prelate who will restore the spirit of its priests now did we already receive a prelate who restored the spirits of its priests. Some argue that we might have in a Pope Benedict figure or a Pope John Paul II figure. I don't know. I don't know. I, I would say probably not because all of these things seem to be getting worse and worse. So... December 8th, 1634. This signifies the most august sacrament of the Eucharist, which will be distributed by my Catholic priests to faithful Christians belonging to the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, whose visible head is the Pope, the King of Christianity. His pontifical infallibility will be declared a dogma of the faith, which we know it was, by the same Pope chosen to proclaim the dogma of the mystery of my Immaculate Conception. He will be persecuted and imprisoned in the Vatican by the unjust usurpation of the pontifical states through the iniquity and vitality envy and avarice of an earthly monarch. In the 19th century, there will be a truly Catholic president, a man of character whom God, our Lord, will give the palm of martyrdom on the square joining the convent. He will consecrate the Republic to the sacred heart of my most holy son, and this consecration will sustain the Catholic religion in the years that will follow, which will be ill-fated ones for the Church. These years, during which the evil sect of Masonry will take control of the civil government, will see a cruel persecution of all religious communities, and they will also strike out violently against the one, this one of mine. So as you can see, um, Our Lady of Good Success, although there is some room for interpretation and some things, you know, I wish were more clearly defined, um, seems to point towards a error of darkness where the church is in eclipse, where the world has fallen away, you know, where there's been this great apostasy within the church and without out of the church it seems to point to this this period um and then she also says that there will be a, a restoration after this now we don't know if this is a, an earthly restoration or if this is the new jerusalem restoration but it, it leads me to believe that it will be probably not the end 
of day's restoration with the new Jerusalem comes down because, you know, one of the last lines is she says, sending to this church the prelate who will restore the spirit of its priests. Now, I don't think we've seen that yet, although some could argue that it was John Paul II. Some could argue that Pope Benedict, maybe. Um, I'm not really sure. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a final judgment on this, but it's all very interesting. Moving on to Our Lady of Akita. This is a, a more recent one in the 70s in Japan. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just... This, um, again, points towards a chastisement. So let's read it and see if this points more towards the great end times apostasy and the end of the world or a very bad apostasy and a very bad chastisement, which will eventually lead to a purification and which will lead to a better world. Um, she said, August 3rd, 1973. I believe this is from Our Lady herself. Many men in this world afflict the Lord. I desire souls to console him to soften the anger of the Heavenly Father. I wish with my son for souls who will repair by their suffering and their poverty for the sinners in ingrates. In order that the world may, might know his anger, the Heavenly Father is preparing to inflict a great chastisement on all mankind. With my son, I have intervened so many times to appease the wrath of the Father. I have prevented the coming of the calamities by offering him the sufferings of the Son of the Cross, his precious blood and beloved souls who console him, forming a cohort of victim souls. Prayer, penance, and courageous sacrifices can soften the Father's anger. I desire this also from your community, that it love poverty, that it sanctify itself and pray in reparation for the ingratitude and outrages of so many men. She further goes on to say, recite the prayer of the handmaids of the Eucharist. Even in secular institute, prayer is necessary. Already souls who wish to pray are on the way to being gathered together without attaching too much attention to the form. Be faithful and fervent in prayer to console the master. Um, October 13th, 1973. As I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as one will never seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful. The survival survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. The only arms which will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left by my son. Each day recite the prayers of the rosary with the rosary pray for the pope, the bishops, and the priests. The work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing, opposing cardinals. Here we are, bishops against bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their conferers. Churches and altars sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromises, huh? And the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. And I just thought of Father Altman. The demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. The thought of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sadness. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will no longer be pardon for them. December 1975, do not, from her guardian angel, oh sorry, she, going back to the other one, pray, pray very much the prayers of the rosary, I alone am able to still save you from the calamities which approach, those who place their confidence in me will be saved, December 1975, her guardian angel, do not be surprised to see the blessed virgin weeping, she weeps because she wishes the conversion of the greatest number, she desires that souls be consecrated to Jesus. September 28, 1981, the guardian angel, there is a meaning to the figure 101, which is the number of times the statue wept. This signifies that sin came into the world by a woman, and it also means by a woman that salvation came into the world. The zero between the two signifies the eternal God who is from all eternity until eternity. The first one represents Eve and the last the Virgin Mary. So in this one, we're talking about the greatest chastisement of all times ever. Is that the end times 
event. We don't have clarification on that. Now, part of the reason why I think we don't is because God himself knows, obviously, when the end of the world will come. But he um, probably has chosen not to reveal that to anyone, as Jesus has kind of told us in, in Scripture, that not even he knew, only the Father in heaven knew. So even if, I don't think we will ever get clarification on this until it actually happens. Next up we have Our Lady of La Salette. Um, and these are the secrets of La Salette, which were written down later by the seer, one of the seers, um, Melanie, I believe her name was. So... This was written down in 1846. The apparitions happened earlier than that. And this is an apparition that is recognized by the Vatican. The priests, the ministers of my son, the priests by their wicked lives, by their irreverence and their impiety in the celebration of the holy mysteries, by their love of money, their love of honors and pleasures, the priests have become cesspools of impurity, yet the priests are asking for vengeance, and vengeance is hanging over their heads. Woe to the priests and those dedicated to God, who by their infidelity and their wicked lives are crucifying my son again. The sins of those consecrated to God cry out towards heaven and call for vengeance, and now vengeance is at their door, for there is no one left to beg mercy and forgiveness for the people. There are no generous souls. There is no one left worthy of offering a spoutless sacrifice to the Eternal on behalf of the world. God will strike in an unprecedented way. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. God will exhaust his wrath upon them and no one will be able to escape so many afflictions altogether. The chiefs, the leaders of the people of God, have neglected prayer and penance, and the devil has bedimmed their intelligence. They have become wandering stars, which the old devil will drag, al drag along with his tail to make them perish. God will allow the old serpent to cause divisions among those who reign in every society and every family. Physical and moral agonies will be suffered. God will abandon mankind to itself and will send punishments, which will follow one after the other for more than 35 years. The society of men is on the eve of the most terrible scourges in the gravest events. Mankind must expect to be ruled with an iron rod and to drink from the chalice of wrath from God. May the vicar of my son, Pope Pius the Ninth, never leave Rome again, after 1859, may he, however, be steadfast and noble. May he fight with his weapons of faith and love. I will be at his side. May he be on his guard against Napoleon. He is two-faced, and he wishes to make himself pope as well as emperor. Soon God will draw back from him. He is the eagle who, always wanting to rise higher, will fall on the sword he wished to use to force people to be, his people to be raised up. Italy will be punished for her ambition and wanting to shake off the yoke of the Lord of Lords, and so she will be left to fight a war. Blood will flow on all sides, and many of this, these things, anyway, have already happened. Churches will be locked or desecrated, um, especially during World War uh, World War II, I believe. was Italy had it pretty bad. Priests and religious orders will be hunted down and made, I think it was World War II, I think maybe both World Wars, but anyway, it made to die a cruel death. Several will abandon the faith, and great number of priests and members of religious orders will break away from the true religion. Among these people, there will even be bishops. And now that sounds like a great apostasy right there. May the Pope guard against the performers of miracles. Wow. For the time has come when the most astonishing wonders will take place in the earth and in the air. In the year 1864, Lucifer, together with a large number of demons, will be unloosed from hell. They will put an end to faith little by little. Even in those dedicated to God, they will blind them in such a way that unless they are blessed with a special grace, these people will take on the spirit of these angels in hell. Several religious institutes will lose faith, faith and lose many souls. Evil books will be abundant on earth, and the spirit of darkness will spread everywhere, a universal slackening in all the concerns all that concerns the service of God. They will have great power over nature. There will be churches built to serve these spirits. People will be transported spiritually from one place to another by these evil spirits, even priests, for they will not have been guided by the good spirit of the gospel, which is the spirit of humility, charity, and zeal for the glory of God. On occasion, the dead and the righteous will be brought back to life. 
That is to say that these dead will take on the form of righteous souls which will have lived on earth in order to lead men further astray. These so-called resurrected dead, who will be nothing but the devil in this form, will preach another gospel contrary to that of the true Jesus Christ, denying the existence of heaven, that is to say the souls of the damned. All these souls will appear as if united with their bodies. In places there will be extraordinary wonders because true faith has died and a false light shines on the world. Woe to the princes of the church whose only occupation will be to heap wealth upon more wealth and to preserve their authority and proud domination. The vicar of my son will have much to suffer for a time. The church will be the victim of great prosecution. This will be a time of darkness. The church will suffer a terrible crisis. As the holy faith of God, and that, I mean, to me it sounds like what's described in the catechism at the end of days. Now these, I don't know of any private revelation so far, any Marian apparition that has outright come out and said the end of the world is upon us. Um, But they seem to all allude to, not all, but most of them seem to allude to what the catechism has described in paragraph 675, the final testing, the final the where the church has to go through her passion. Now the question is what lies on the other side of that? And according to the catechism, what lies on the other side of it is the church will only be resurrected when the Lord himself comes to do just that. Um, now, is there going to be, like I said, a purification before the end of days and that maybe that's what we're seeing right now and that's still far off? We don't know. Okay. Um, as, the Holy Father, as the Holy Faith of God is forgotten, every individual wished to be his own guide and superior to his fellow man. Civil and... E- e- I can't talk today. Civil and church authority will be abolished. All order and justice will be trampled underfoot. Nothing will be seen but murder, hatred, jealousy, falsehood, and discord without love for the mother, country, or the family. The Holy Father will suffer greatly. I will be by his side in the end, to the end in order to receive his sacrifice. The wicked will, be, will make several attempts on his life, but they cannot harm him. But neither he nor his successor will live to see the triumph of the church of God. Now that's interesting. What is meant by the triumph of the church of God? Well, according to the catechism, the triumph of the church of God will only happen when the new, at the last days, right? I mean, that's what it says. And um, the church will enter the glory of the kingdom only through this final Passover. She will then follow the Lord in his death and resurrection. The kingdom will be fulfilled then, not by a historic triumph of the church through a progressive ascendancy, but only by God's victory over the final unleashing of evil. All the civil governments will have one in the same plan, which will be to abolish and to do away with every religious principle to make way for materialism, atheism, spiritualism, and vices of all kinds. And obviously that's happening. In the year 1865, there will be desecration of holy places and convents. The flower of the church will decompose and the devil will make himself like the king of all hearts. That is definitely happening. May those in charge of religious communities be on guard against the people they must receive. For the devil will resort to all his evil tricks to induce sinners into religious orders. And that is the infiltration of communists and the infiltration of the the Masons. For disorder and the love of carnal pleasures will be spread all over the earth. And it goes on. Um, And I'll post a link if you want to read it. Let me see if there's any. The righteous will suffer greatly. Their prayers, their penance, and their tears will rise up to heaven. And all of God's people will beg for forgiveness and mercy and will plead for my help and intercession. And then Jesus Christ, in an act of his justice and his great mercy, will command his angels to have all his enemies put to death. Suddenly, the persecutors of the church of of Jesus Christ and all those given over to sin will perish and the earth will be desert-like, and then peace will be made and man will be reconciled with God. Jesus Christ will be served, worshipped, and glorified. Charity will flourish everywhere. The new kings will be the right arm of the Holy Church, which will be strong, humble, pious, and its poor but fervent 
imitations of Jesus Christ. The gospel will be preached everywhere, and mankind will make great progress in its faith, for there will be unity amongst the workers of Jesus Christ, and man will live in fear of God. This peace among men will be short-lived. Twenty-five years of plentiful harvest will make them forget that the sins of men are the cause of all the troubles of this earth. A forerunner of the Antichrist. So this um, sounds more now in line with a purification that leads to what, sh what they're saying is a period of peace. Maybe the Immaculate Heart of Mary, uh, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary as prophesied in Fatima and what Our Lady of La Salette was talking about as far as um, a, Greek, a prelate, a holy pope. Um, and then this goes on to say this peace among men will be short lived. 25 years of plentiful harvest will make them forget the sins of men are the cause of all the troubles on this earth. A forerunner of the Antichrist with his troops gathered from several nations will fight against the true Christ. Against the true Christ, the only savior of the world. He will shed much blood and will want to annihilate the worship of God to make himself be looked upon as a God. Then. The earth will be struck by calamities of all kinds, in addition to plague and famine, which will be widespread. There will be a series of wars until the last war, which will then be fought by the ten kings of the Antichrist, all of whom will have one in the same plan and will be the only rulers of the world. Before this comes to pass, there will be a kind of false peace in the world. People will think of nothing but amusement. Huh. The wicked will give themselves over to all kinds of sin. But the children of the Holy Church, the children of the faith, my true followers, they will grow in their love for God in all the virtues, and in all the virtues most precious to me. Blessed are the souls humbly guided by the Holy Spirit. I will fight on their side until the, they reach a fullness of years. The seasons will be altered. Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. The demons of the air together with the Antichrist will perform great wonders on earth. And in the atmosphere, and men will become more and more perverted. God will take care of his faithful servants and the men of goodwill. The gospel will be preached everywhere, and people of all nations will get to know the truth. I make an appeal to earth. I call on the true disciples of the living God who reigns in heaven. I call on my children, the true faithful, those who have given themselves to me, so that I may lead them to my divine Son, those whom I carry in my arms, so to speak, those who have lived according to my spirit. Finally, I call on the apostles of the last days, the faithful disciples of Jesus Christ who have lived in scorn for the world and for themselves in poverty and humility and in scorn and in silence and prayer and mortification, in chastity and in union with God, in suffering and unknown to the world. It is time they come out and filled the world with light. Go and reveal yourselves as my cherished children. I am on your side and within you provided your faith is the light which shines upon you in these unhappy days. May your zeal make you hungry for the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. Fight, children of light, you the few ones who can see. For now is the time of all times, the end of all ends. The church will be in eclipse. The world will be in dismay. But now Enoch and Elijah will come, filled with the Spirit of God. They will preach with the might of God, and the men of good will will believe in God, and many souls will be comforted. 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 They will make great strides for forward through the virtue of the Holy Spirit and will condemn the diabolical errors of the Antichrist. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. There will be bloody wars and famines, plagues, and infectious diseases. It will rain with a fear fearful hail of animals. There will be thunderstorms which will shake cities, earthquakes which will sw swallow up countries, voices which will be heard in the air. Men will beat their heads against walls, call for death, and on the other hand, death will be their torment. Because there will be torment. This is a diabolical oppression is what this is in possession. Blood will flow on all sides. Who will be the victor if God does not shorten the duration of the test? At the blood, the tears and the prayers of the righteous, God will relent. Enoch and Elijah will be put to death. Pagan Rome will disappear. The fire of heaven will fall and consume three cities. All the universe will be struck with terror and many will let themselves be led astray because they have not worshipped the true Christ who lives among them. It is time the sun is darkening only faith will survive now is the time the abyss is opening here is the king of kings of darkness here is the beast beast with his subjects calling himself the savior of the world he will rise proudly in the air to go to heaven he will 
be smothered by the breath of the archangel St. Michael. He will fall and the earth, which will have been in a continual series of evolutions for three days, will open its fiery bowels and he will be plunged for eternity with all of his followers into the everlasting chasms of hell and then water and fire will, pur fire will purge the earth, consume all the work of men's pride and will be renewed. God will be served and glorified. So that's a lot. Um, but at least here we have sort of a... Um, we have a pure a chastisement, a minor chastisement period, and then we have somewhat of an era of peace, um, which will be short-lived. 25 years of plentiful harvest will make them forget that the sins of men are the cause of all the troubles on this earth. And some argue that we have already re um, been in this era of peace. Again, I don't know. Um, and then after that will be the Antichrist, and then the final you know, chastisements and things like that when the earth will be destroyed and then the new Jerusalem will be brought down. Now, the question is, um, where are we? And the question is, and the answer is, I don't have the answer for you, but I find it very fascinating that all of these revelations that were given years ago seem to be spot on talking about our times to the T, to the T. And my personal opinion on the matter is that we are seeing at least the beginnings of a great apostasy, probably the end times apostasy, just because of what it says in the catechism. The great apostasy is going to be man glorifying himself over God. And that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing the Pope the Pope of in, sitting in Rome on international television getting a jab that was derived from human sacrifice. If that is, and then telling people they have a moral obligation to do so. If that's not a great apostasy or the end times great apostasy of glorifying men above God and his laws, then I don't know what it's going to look like because <laughs> it doesn't get more cut and dry than that. So this video is extraordinary, extraordinarily long if you hung in there with me um, up until this point. I'm going to end it now even though I could keep probably talking forever about this topic because it's fascinating. And put in the comments what you think. I know there are several schools of thought and I have covered them on my channel in regards to eras of peace and the timeline of the Antichrist. Um, I have to say my line of thought is, well... There may be a period of peace, a short period of peace, like it says in La Salette. It's not going to be the thousand years reign of peace. The thousand years has already started, and a thousand years just means a long period of time. And that started, you know, at, at Christ dying on the cross, Satan was bound, his powers were diminished. Um, but now we see a return of Satan's powers. Why? Because of a great apostasy. That's why. And the more people of God apostatize from God, the more Satan's powers increase on this earth. Just so we can all keep that in mind. Um, so if there is going to be maybe a minor chastisement and then some sort of purification of the church, um, and then before the end times Antichrist, that could be a possibility. We have several apparitions that do allude to that. But they could also be interpreted from the lens of being restored as in the great and final restoration as well. So we can't discount that. There's several lens. And I think the best lens to read all these apparitions through is always through the lens of the catechism. And what they describe, it seems to fit exactly what the catechism is describing as the final trial. And now obviously this is going to take a number of years and this isn't just going to be quick and over. And I'm sure there will be a number of mini purifications in which people wake up and realize, oh my goodness, like I have to convert to God as well as more people continuing to fall away. So these things can all kind of happen simultaneously. Um, I am kind of, I've read both schools of thought as far as when the Antichrist is going to come and all this stuff and my or how he's going to be destroyed. My school of thought is that Antichrist will be at the end of time. God himself will come directly to destroy the Antichrist 
and then the new Jerusalem will happen. Now, if there's going to be a period of peace and restoration before the Antichrist appears, I'm open to that. But I don't I don't believe in the theory of the Antichrist coming, then, you know, being destroyed, and then a period of peace. I don't think that's, you know, at one point I did kind of entertain that, and I've made videos about it, and there are books written about it, and they're very convincing. Um, but just from from the consensus of everything. I, I do believe there could be some sort of purification and some sort of restoration, but that would be separate from the Antichrist in the end times. I don't think we can divorce the Antichrist from the physical returning of Christ. So that's all I got. So congratulations if you hung in there with me on this rainy day and let me know what you think. Our Lady of the End Times, pray for us. Uh, Joan of Arc Media out.